Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Now, we have one of my favorite recurring guests here today, uh, none other than Professor Nancy Sherman. And uh, this is actually a Practical Stoic live interview. So we had a few of my awesome Patreon supporters in the background uh, waiting to ask their questions. So if you'd like to support the show, and if you'd like to come to future interviews like this, and if you'd like to hear a whole bunch of interviews and, 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 uh, and episodes from before 2020, including an interview that I did with Nancy Sherman, then you can go to my Patreon. It's just patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. But today we had a really fascinating conversation about the life and teachings of Seneca. And so this was, you know, a really exciting conversation for me because, I, you know, he's one of my favorite teachers, ancient teachers, uh, let alone my favorite Stoic. Uh, but uh, yeah, such a fascinating conversation. Nancy always has so much wisdom to share and you've got all of the links in the show notes to where you can find her books, her websites, everything that she's up to online. I'd love for you to go and check that out as well. Now, anyway, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Professor Nancy Sherman. Okay, so Nancy Sherman, welcome back to the Practical Stoic Podcast. I always love having you here and um, you always bring such a wealth of knowledge. And today we were going to pretty much do a whole overview of Seneca and his life. And and, um, I had a lot of positive feedback last time because we did speak about Seneca a lot and you have a really uh, beautiful perspective of Seneca and his life. Uh, and and you have a beautiful perspective of what he can add to the philosophy. So, why don't we start with, I guess, a little bit of an overview of of Seneca's uh, w- what we know about his early life, his you know middle life, and towards the end, and mm-hmm. give a, a bit of a historical picture of um, the kind of period that Seneca was living through. So Seneca uh, is the son of a very famous orator. So or rhetorician, uh, and Seneca, you know, is roughly, he's often called Seneca the Younger, is spanning uh, the uh, beginning of the Common Era, end of before the Common Era to the Common Era. So it was sort of around the time of Christ. Um, He was a sickly youth, uh, and... um, had you know possibly a suicide attempt as a result of illness uh was sent away to heal um and then um he comes back to rome uh is known for his amazing rhetorical skills himself having trained with his father and at some point he's exiled to corsica by Claudius uh, for about eight years. Mm. It's not the Corsica we know now. My daughter um, lived in Corsica for three years and I visited it many times, um, that gorgeous island um, Mm. south of Sardinia. Um, It was pretty barren. It was pretty horrific. And so uh, hard to get food, uh, lonely. It was banishment, which was not uncommon for uh, Romans um, who were um, sent away. And he was sent away because of an alleged adulterous relationship with Claudius's niece, I think, Livia. Mm. Uh, so that said, he's there. He's you know managing, and he gets called back to Rome by none other than Agrippina. And that's Claudius's wife and Nero, and the young Nero's uh, uh, mother. And she wants this uh, 
amazing man of letters and of, of speeches to be her son's tutor. So mm. her son, she expects, will be the prince. He's a young, wily uh, boy. And Seneca comes back. And so he owes his, his resuscitation, you might say, to Agrippina. That said, he gets in the court, Nero's emperor at this point, um, and he becomes the spin doctor, speechwriter, counselor, not so much um, philosophical tutor, although many of these, uh, most of uh, Roman men have Hellenistic tutors of some sort. But, you know, but he's, um, he's definitely uh, the man of letters and is going to kind of help him. But he gets messed up in a lot of uh, court intrigue including mm. ultimately um, uh, another contender for the throne, Britannicus, um, who's, who's killed, uh, Claudius' son, and another, and Agrippina falls on the wrong side of a dispute with her, with her son, and, and we presume Seneca knows about that. So, you know, he's an apologist at a, a lot of the times. He's not clean, he's got dirty hands, he swims in muddy waters. Uh, mm. And that's what makes him interesting, because he's not a prissy guy. He's, um, you know, some people can't stand him because he's a hypocrite, some say. Um, mm. uh, but he knows travail, and he also knows political struggle, and he's in the thick of it a lot of the time. And he's attracted to materialism. This is a, this is a court, you know, in Rome that is, is gilded. And he's he reputedly has lots of marble tables and is a vintner. And um, so uh, when, he's, when he writes uh, about letting go and abstention, he, he knows it because he knows about cravings. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a great point that you brought up last time is that, that Seneca can, can teach us so much about these kinds of emotions in ourselves because he actually uh, was really, you know, fighting them himself you know he, he understood that they might not necessarily be the most effective approach for happiness in life but still he he was there and he played a large role in you know Nero's government and one question I had was uh, are we looking at some sort of like shadow government scenario here was he like the man behind the was he pulling all the strings behind Nero uh, as an advisor to Nero or was he just going along with the ride hoping that he wouldn't get sentenced to death, which, you know, eventually happened. Some of both, you know, I'm not a historian, so I can't, mm. you know, I don't really know the inside. Um, most, many of those who came into Stoicism were political folk, you know, they're mm. persons of means. The disciples were not, you know, all Epictetus style who have just come out of political bondage and have no interest in staying clear of government. Musonius Rufus, who is the teacher of Epictetus himself, says that you know, he's got a lot of people who are politicians waiting in the wings for when their mm. time might come to be able to move into government. Um, but, but the time wasn't right then. So mm. Seneca's very, very well placed. But so is Cic so someone like Cicero, you know, these are, um, it's hard to describe, but politics and philosophy, especially this practical philosophy, went glove in hand. Uh, these, and you had to be able to write amazing speeches that would last for posterity and mm. um, at times be an apologist. Mm. So yeah, shadow government, I wouldn't quite say, but he's, you know, he's an advisor. He's a, he's a strong yeah. advisor, but also really, really smart. And he's got an incredibly unruly young prince mm. who he, you know, watches carefully, but not always that carefully. Yeah. And, and I think there's probably an argument to be made that, uh, it, his his advising Nero was was vastly out of uh, necessity for him. I mean, because he was called back from exile to start advising Nero, right? And yeah, so he, I mean, it was essentially was just... like, hey, do you want your freedom? Well, here's an opportunity. Come and advise this young kid who's going to be the emperor. 
I mean, patronage. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> yeah. He, he, know, he, know, he knows where his bread's buttered, and yeah. he also knows how easy it is to fall out of favor. So they're constantly mm. doing dances. I mean, these are tyrants. I mean, mm. unbridled tyrant. This is you know, whether Nero uh, fiddled while Rome burned is another question. But he certainly mm. loved to perform, and Rome probably did burn while he was doing one of his performances. Um, mm. he, was a, he was an artist of sorts with the lyre, but he liked the stage. So yeah, these are colorful, colorful characters and frightening characters. But the philosophy <laughs> is all the more interesting because it's, um, it's not just someone bashing you over the head with, you know, you, you like your body, get rid of it. That's Epictetus, you know. You like your donkey, you know, your body's just a donkey. Get rid of it. I mean, that's, it's very crass in some ways. Mm. This is not crass stuff. Mm. Yeah, he, he does. He, he kind of gets to the, gets to the core of these, um, uh, these kind of emotions that we feel. And also, he, you know, he, man, he's, he's self-preservation 101. I mean, like he, he made it through eight years of exile and then he comes back and he's dealing with this, uh, you know, advising this tyrannical emperor and, um, you know, he survives one death sentence. I think what, what was it? He was, he was accused of, of um, sleeping with somebody and then he was, he was sentenced to death. But then one of the women in the court basically convinced the emperor that, well, he's going to die anyway because he's ill. So don't worry about it. And so he's I mean, even got off scot-free a couple of times, right? <laughs> Yeah, but the political stuff is less interesting in many ways mm. than the philosophy because he yeah. writes really powerful tracks on mm. anger that may leave you wondering, all anger? Is it all bad? What about moral indignation, moral protest, moral outcry? Does it all have to be slippery slope? Uh, you know, take like a runner who can't stop anger is that kind of impetuous uh, uh, getaway emotion um, or can you moderate it like Aristotle said um, that a, a certain amount of anger uh, in the right place at the right time toward the right persons is extremely valuable you know so mm. I think um, his stuff raises interesting philosophical questions um, so you don't yeah. none of these philosophies should be taken without many, many, many grains of salt and without critical engagement. Otherwise, it's, it's just ideology is my mm. view of the matter. Um, it's, it can only be useful if it's critically engaged with. Yeah, and, and I think that, that one important part of that is, right, we're looking at the ideas, not necessarily the man. We can, we can kind of separate the man from the ideas in terms of... And women, you know, and I mean, persons. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> of course. But I'm talking specifically about Seneca. Uh, yeah, when, it, right. when it comes to Seneca, it, it can be easy to be like, oh, look at him. He was advisor to a tyrannical emperor and he was such a hypocrite and everything. But man, some of his ideas, they cut to the core of it. And I, I really want to get into that philosophy. One, one question I have to, to kind of start our discussion around his philosophy was, mm -hmm. so as you said, we know that he was sick when he was younger, possibly a suicide attempt. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I read that he said at one point that the only reason why he didn't commit suicide was because he wanted to live out his life and take care of his father, you know, so he had a sense of responsibility. Um, and you see echoes of kind of an indifference towards suicide throughout his writings and throughout other Stoics writings, right? There's, there's almost like a, um, what I'm wondering is, is it the man first or is, as in Seneca, or is it the philosophy first? Was it, was it the philosophy that brought him this idea of, of, you know, this body, it doesn't really matter. You can, you can literally just leave this world if, if it's too painful for you, or was it his upbringing and his overcoming this illness that, that brought that kind of philosophy about? think it's his illness that I mean that would be too simple a story so I don't think it's mm. uh, a single determinant that stoicism is the philosophy in the air at the time it, it's mm. the dominant philosophy there are other schools Aristotle's kind of um, you know he's gone off to um, um, to advise Alexander so he's kind of out of out of well he's certainly out of Athens mm. um, 
And there's a lot of Greeks that are coming in to Athens and then into Rome. And in a, so let's just back up. The ancient Stoa, the Greek, you know, is in, is in Athens and it's in the marketplace. And they gathered at the Stoa and that's mm. one school. But there were also the, um, uh, the uh, excuse me, the skeptics who were skeptical about Stoicism. That's um, uh, their main um, claim. You know, the, the, the Stoics say dogmatically this, and I'm going to argue mm. against it. And then there are the Epicureans, who are not what we think of Epicureans as, you know, pleasure-hungry folk, but they thought that the final good, the ultimate end, is um, absence of pain or pleasure. And so that, yeah. that's how they view flourishing. Uh, or eudaimonia. So there were, in the Greek world, there are a lot of competition and competing schools. Once you get to, um, into the Roman period, st uh, excuse me, Stoic philosophy does become the, the court philosophy, the household philosophy. It's just everywhere. Mm. It's what you're taught. It's like learning mathematics or something like that. So it, it's kind of overdetermined that Seneca would, would go that way. Mm -hmm. And Cicero is really attracted to Stoicism. He's earlier, and he's the kind of transition point. He translates Greek into Latin and tries to find words for Stoic philosophy, but he's not himself a, um, a, an expositor. So it's very complicated. It's around, it's just the court philosophy. And, mm -hmm. and suicide isn't what we think of it. It's, it's, it's the noble way to leave, mm -hmm. you know? They've already got Socrates in their head, you know? Yeah. You, um, Socrates is the uh, paragon there. They've got that in their head. Oh, let's mythologize him a little bit more. But mm. Roman, you know, um, suicide is just not what we think of as suicide. You, you know, yeah. you can do it yourself or it's forced upon you and it's a political uh, tool. So, I, you know, we, mm. we shouldn't get it too entangled with courage or, or, um, or selflessness or which, however you want to mm. go. It's, it's, and, and Seneca struggles with retirement from political life in his old age when he writes the letters to, you know, in a purported back and forth with Lucilius. It's really about you don't give up political engagement easily because, mm. you know, people are going to wonder why you're not there. Why, why have you left? That was the worry of Cicero's. Why have I left Rome when I'm grieving for my daughter, Tulia, who died in childbirth? I'm here in the Tusculan Hills. What's Caesar going to think um, that mm. I haven't gone to the forum? So they're really worried about um, absence, mm. invisibility, uh, the political consequences of invisibility. You know, those that are engaged in political life. Epictetus is not a political animal, but he also doesn't have that rank. He, you know, he's not kind of up there in the political um, echelons. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think the ideas are what we should think about and not mm. the parallels with the political world. I mean, the political world was messy, to be sure. Mm. And we had a tyrant, to be sure. And, you know, and there's lots of resonances, to be sure, <laughs> that people yeah. have been drawing of late uh, with strong men all around the world who are filling voids um, on, uh, in a scary, scary way. But mm. there's also, you know, this guy writes about mercy. He's trying to show a wayward uh, leader ways to think about justice and mercy. You know, he writes about benefits, benefactions. How do you mm. go back and forth in giving and give the right gift and not the wrong gift and, accept gratitude graciously um, and accept a gift really graciously, even if it's the wrong gift, <laughs> mm. you know, like you yeah. hate it. Um, someone gives you a country, a, a jacket in the middle, a heavy winter coat in the middle of summer, you're still supposed to kind of show some gratitude, but mm. next time the benefactor should be better in their selection of gifts. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and and these were all questions that the the major philosophers were trying to answer. Right? I'm, I'm I'm reading um, you know Diogenes' Life of the Eminent Philosophers, and you know so many of these philosophers wrote about the exact same things. It's 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 like they were all trying to figure out just all of these questions about how to be a good human being, and and I I hear that one a lot. You know this discussion on benefits and um, and friendship and and 
so, so what do you think are the biggest things that Seneca can add to the kind of stoic canon of ideas? Like what, where does he really okay. shine? Cause obviously Epictetus brings a lot of new stuff and Marcus Aurelius as well. What was Seneca's mark that he left? Seneca is a, an exquisite writer. So all mm. of the rhetorical skills are on display. He's not just pithy one-liners. So in some ways, Epictetus is, you know, he's got 18 to 22 year old boys in his, as his disciples. As a teacher, you want to catch him and yeah. he's going to catch him. And the, the, what he says, the ones who are soft, you know, like cheese <laughs> won't resist my efforts at kind of badgering them a bit. Mm. Um, so, that's not Seneca so much. Seneca is a much, much more mature writer. Um, he's also a literary writer. He writes plays. Um, you know, some dispute whether he's the real author of the plays, but I think he is. And um, the plays are absolutely amazing. They put, you know, some of them are better versions of the themes that the Greeks took on, like Trojan women, unbelievable, I think, and Hercules rages. I just think they're incomparable. So even if they're from another hand, but I don't think they are. So he's just of a different, you know, variety. Mm. Um, he has a really interesting take on emotions. It's partly the standard view that there's, um, levels of emotional experience, um, mm. both um, pro proto-emotions or pre-emotions that are like autonomic arousals, shivers and shakes, blushing and tears that you don't bring, that you don't um, uh, um, um, d demand come out, but that just fall, mm. he says. Um, pallor going pale and or white and blanching in a shipwreck, that kind of stuff. Um, a general's knees shaking when he hears a trumpet call for a charge into the battle. Um, but also reading about um, uh, the greats of history. They also, you also can kind of get a vicarious arousal when you read about Hannibal or something like that. So he's got that and it's in real mm -hmm. detail, amazing detail. Um, which actually Philo of um, Alexander, Philo Judaeus also picks up. So they're probably picking it up from the same source, an early source. And then he tells us about the ones that where um, volition or, or your will really has to assent to what you, to the harm or injury that you take on. And he gives examples, you know, that, that that's the moment your mind um, makes the emotion its own in a certain way. It, 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 um, it assents to the impression that you've been injured. It's not just a, um, a kind of quick and dirty response and arousal. Um, and then he also seems to uh, give the ancient uh, Greek view of emotions of, of the sort of like, almost like Aristotle's um, um, emotions that hit the mean. They're, they're, um, they're the cultivated emotions um, mm. that a sage or a wise person can experience real joy in doing your, um, in being virtuous or um, in having virtuous friends, um, caution and not being, and not trafficking in evil or avoiding mm. it um, or avoiding moral compromise. Um, and also um, a kind of um, desire to, to um, have good friends, friends of character. So those are, he's, he's got a lot of that out there and he, mm. he's a sort of a, you know, it's standard Stoic stuff, standard ancient Greek Stoic stuff, but he puts yeah. some of it out there, it fills it out. And he also kind of clothes it with some Roman decorum. This, when you were talking about, we were talking about gift giving. Well, it, it's not just that the Romans are into benefactions, how you give gifts and how you accept gifts with grace. But mm. it's also about um, what's the uptake? What are your eyes like? Who are you looking at? Did they catch this or not? Excuse me. Um, uh, and so 
spam call. We've <laughs> um, <laughs> got a lot of them lately. Uh, so I guess he's, you know, he's got a, a very big range. Um, yeah. How you retire from political life. Consolations. He has a whole lot of um, um, examples of the Roman style of writing consolations to individuals who just mm. had losses. Yeah, and, and that's, that's actually something that I, I think is so beautiful about what we find in Seneca. No, firstly, I think it's so, so awesome that he had such a prolific, uh, a, that there was just there was so much that he wrote. And, and we understand now that there was actually a lot that we don't have from him that was lost through, through time, right? And so, you know, he was writing plays, he was writing about natural questions, which we have, which is awesome. And, you know, he was, he was writing letters to friends. I don't know how he had time to write all of this stuff, but... but he didn't have email. <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> he didn't have um, Facebook, so he wasn't distracted. But, but I think what's, um, what's beautiful about Seneca is, is as you suggest, he really brings it back to kind of like an earthy kind of philosophical feel as opposed to the, you know, here's, here's the ideal and like Epictetus was trying to teach people this is how you live the best life. Seneca was just a lot of the time talking to his friends about real issues that they were dealing with and trying to offer some sort of guidance for the average person who isn't necessarily considered to be a philosopher or aspiring to be a philosopher who's just dealing with something tragic or dealing with something sad in their life or, and he offered this beautiful wisdom. And I think that the thing that I love most about Seneca is that he had such a, such a, what would you say? Um, he really felt as though philosophy was for the every man, for the every woman, you know, it was for everyone. It was, it was, it was something to be picked up in order to help you to deal with the tragedy of life, to help you to deal with, better relationships and and can you speak to that the the practicality in Seneca's writing so Seneca is um like I guess many of the Stoics it, he's a practical philosopher so this mm. is not Plato or Aristotle mm. um once we get it, it's not even Zeno Chrysippus or or, or Cleantes. once we get into the Roman Stoics they are practical philosophers. It's street philosophy, I guess you might mm. say, um, because they, um, you know, if it, if it began in the marketplace in, in Athens, it moved to the households and courts in Rome. So um, now many of these guys were well-placed. Seneca had friends that were well-placed. You know, these are people that are, leading major battles in major parts of the Roman empire. So these are not, you know, low, low guys on the totem pole. These are mm -hmm. men of uh, largely of stature. Um, and, but he wants his letters to live on. I mean, that's one of the inconsistencies. He's really against glory because it's, it's, um, it, it, sh it's an, an, it should be the stuff to which it attaches should be indifference, not real goods, not genuine goods. Um, honor and um, fame and um, and reputation, but mm, I'd like my letters to live on. He says, "I really mm. it would be it would be great, Lucilius, who's a real person, but the letters that he writes really aren't to him. There's no we have no record of the of the return to the sender, though mm. though we have Seneca saying, I can't wait to get your letter. It's so." I'm, you know, I'm bated breath. I sit here waiting for the mailman to come, but you know, but there's no mailman dropping the letter off. These are, <laughs> this is a, this is a purported relationship. It's a literary art style. Um, wow. it's, the epistle writing is a literary, you know, it's a literary form. So, but they're, the, the letters are, you know, as you say about real things that happen, you know, our friend, I can't remember which friend this was, but any may be real or not, but our friend in Lyon, um, uh, just uh, experienced the most devastating fires I've ever seen. You know, I'm, I don't know how it compares to Rome, but Lyon mm. was apparently wiped out. And uh, you, you, despite the stoic practice of, uh, of rehearsing evils in order to help build resistance to bads when they really do occur, he says, 
I, we couldn't anticipate that one. It's you know re very relevant to the pandemic. Um, we could have been better prepared globally. There is absolutely no doubt. Mm. In the United States, we could have been better prepared. Um, we know about commissions that were out there, groups that have been disbanded and were disbanded at the wrong moment. So any epidemiologist will tell you that and not enough funding. But even with that kind of preparation and the most cooperative endeavors of all the best scientists, doctors, and, and um, researchers, we still, this one is really large, you know, unless you're a student of the Spanish um, flu, 1918, you're not going to, you know, this one, this one is amazing and we're at different levels. So he mm. gives some sense of that, you know, like, I couldn't imagine a fire of this devastation and, and you know, what it brought on. Mm. And so there's a, a you know, the, there's a softness to it. There's a gentleness to it. This is not, you know, get over it, move on. You, these are not real injuries. The only real injury is if your soul is damaged. By your soul, I mean your moral mm. psyche. Um, that's not that's not what he's saying. This is sort of a real thing. That said, the next step after that gentle consolation is what can we do to kind of make it to endure the agony better? And so yeah. you know, he sort of next moves on that there are some things you can control and some things you can't, and maybe we will you know, and even mortality, that's mm. something we can't control. And that's an absolute preoccupation in the letters because he's in his last two years or so of his life, you know, mm. you know, how attached do I have to be to, to my, to my life, that kind of thing. So yeah. I, I don't mean to say these, these are not your most touchy feely people by any means. And Seneca's not, I'm not trying to say that, but I think the way they're often portrayed is, you know, tough, suck it up, tough it out, you know, rugged self-reliance. That That's not the whole or the be all and end all. Yeah. No, and I, and, and I think that w one of the reasons why his writings are so, um, they speak to you so much is because he does have a way of getting you to see what he's trying to teach you about his philosophy without making you angry that he's pointing out something within you. So in that letter um, about the fires at, um, at Leon, um, or Lyon or whatever, um, how you pronounce that. But um, the, what I love about it is he's showing genuine concern for his friend who is going through a really rough time because his whole city's burned down. And it's like, how could you possibly come to terms with that? The fact that, and he said like nothing was left and, and how unlikely is this, but, here it's happened. But amongst all of that sympathy that he has for his friend, he'll teach you that, um, hey, listen, just so you know, surprise always makes a catastrophe worse. And so maybe the thing that we could do is imagine absolutely everything that could possibly happen so that if it does happen, uh, you won't have the element of surprise and therefore you might be able to face it with a little bit, you'll know that it was there and, and you'll face it with some more equanimity. And he would teach you without you feeling as though you're being taught. And this comes from obviously, as you're saying, a long-term relationship with words and with speeches and with plays. And like he, he's a absolute, I, I think I wrote down here, I, I felt as though he's a, a craftsman of words, you know, that's his, stock and trade. Um, and, and, and I absolutely love that about his writing. And what, what do you think, uh, what do you think have been some of the ripples throughout history? Do we know of how he has influenced people throughout history? Are there any influential people who have taken his words? And, um, I guess I don't quite know what I'm trying to say here, but what do you think are the biggest lessons that we've taken from him or the biggest ripples into our society? Well, the, Sto the Stoics were bedtime reading throughout, you know, so uh, they influenced Chris Christianity. They, I mm. mentioned Philo Judeus, uh, 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 a Hellenistic Stoic um, Jewish philosopher um, in Alexandria. Um, who at one point actually goes in a part of a commission to Caligula, but he's writing a, 
about that. And, and he actually interprets the Old Testament using terms very similar to Seneca's about these uh, propathei, the early, the uh, proto emotions, pre emotions. Hmm. Um, Abraham um, didn't really cry when he went to Sarah's grave. He was about to cry and then he caught himself. Sarah mm. didn't really laugh when she was told as a centenarian, centenarian that she's going to ha have a child. She just had an inner laugh and it, and it was sort of on the verge of a divine joy. So mm. Seneca, so there's, we don't think Philo probably knew Seneca, but they're coming from the same source. So that's interpreting um, later interpreters of, of the Old Testament. Mm. Uh, we know that the medievals read uh, the, uh, the Stoics. If it wasn't Epictetus, it would be Seneca, that sort of thing. We know Montaigne was totally smitten by this stoics but he you know he wasn't a i mean he it was just if you were educated you read them that's just the bottom line if you were mm. educated you read it it was just classics it's a classical education and it all just was there um similarly um the founding fathers of the um of america um the united states of america were you know most of them would read seneca uh, or epictetus it's it, just bedtime reading Prior to that, Kant, Immanuel Kant, the greatest, to my mind, the greatest Enlightenment philosopher, um, has all sorts of indebtedness, if not to Seneca, um, because wait, I don't know exactly whom he read, but mm. to the idea of a commonwealth of reason, all rational, per all persons participating in reason. That's over and over again a Stoic theme that we share, that we're part of a cosmos, but Kant's going to create it as a for all persons having equality because they are have equal dignity because they share in reason. That is straight out of the Stoics. Mm -hmm. Now the Stoics didn't know what to do with it, but you know, the natural law theorists interpreted it and then Kant kind of got that as well. The idea of, of um, governments um, founded on some basis of natural law. So it, 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 it has in some ways a much bigger stamp on political philosophy, uh, organization of governments, mm. than even Plato or Aristotle. Plato or Aristotle are philosophies, you know, they're not, they weren't used. This stuff is used. Yeah. It's literally a tool for, for uh, A, for educated readers, and then those educated readers might become statespersons, constitution writers, all that mm. stuff. It's, you know, yeah. it's very, very, you couldn't even begin to kind of catalog the history of Stoicism. It's interesting. It gets ignored by and large by academics like myself and others, because it's cheap. I have to say some of it is cheap. It's mm. not, it's not good philosophy. This is not like reading Aristotle. You know, mm. I'm an Aristotle scholar. It is not like reading Aristotle. Aristotle is careful. He's not in for, you know, he's not out for the big bucks. He's not out for the laugh. He's not out to give you a little upper today or a little scolding tomorrow. That's yeah. not what he's interested in. It's not about popularizing. These guys popularized. And so they had mm. an audience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Augustine, Aquinas, they certainly had an audience as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, and, and 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 I think what's um what's what's interesting is just the amount of freedom that Seneca had. Like you even think about uh, the way that he talks about, like you said, it, the individual dignity of every human. And so he had these views about um, you know ways that you could probably better treat your slaves. And we we kind of think today we're like, oh gosh, he had slaves, you know, and it's easy to to judge based on our current understanding. So did Jefferson this. and Jefferson exactly. probably, you know, married one or had children with one of them. There's a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of overlay our current context over it. But if you look at the context of the time, these things that he was saying were almost kind of politically radical, right? Like this idea, especially in Rome, that you should treat your slaves almost as if, yeah, they are your brother or your sister. And so you should treat them kinder and you should like, he, he kind of had these, almost radical views, right? I don't think they were 
never so much radical as he's, he knows the runaway emotion of anger. Mm. And he knows that, you know, you could throw your slave or servant into the, uh, you know, the shark pool for breaking a goblet. Mm. But that's a kind of example often given. And you better learn how to abstain. And, you know, one day dry, two day dry, three days dry, maybe you'll finally get it. So it's sort mm. of on the model of, of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, of, of uh, abstention. <laughs> because I think he, know that, I mean, that's the worry so much. It's not so much enlightenment. It's what you'll do to yourself, that certain emotions are so debilitating that they master you. Mm. They, um, they just become impetuous. Um, mm. And so the flip side is you want to say, okay, so I won't be vindictive. I shouldn't, revenge is pretty ugly. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't necessarily, you know, um, it, taking revenge on someone and demoting them doesn't necessarily elevate you. Um, a status demotion isn't necessarily an ele a status elevation on the part of the, um, the um, uh, uh, punisher. Um, it, he says that, you know, the face of the angry person is swollen. And no, there's not a picture of self-degradation that's more hideous. So, mm -hmm. you know, it makes you look kind of horrific. Um, and then there's all the political chaos. There's wars, there's um, enmity, there's um, devastation of humanity as a result of anger. Um, there's, so he's thinking about it, I think, in terms of anger is a pretty ugly emotion. There is just no way about it. There's sexual abuse, there's pedophilic abuse, there's um, get back, there's demands for loyalty and vindictiveness if you don't show it. But then you have to really ask, okay, so is, is there some way we can harness anger for good? And he doesn't tell us much about that. So that's where the critical piece has to come in. Can, is, there, is, is there like a proto-emotion of anger that you can then turn into a motivation for good? Um, because you're controlling it and directing it and, um, and you know it's important for the flourishing of, of, of humanity. For example, if you take mm. up the cause of someone who's been subordinated a woman who's been subordinated or a, a gay person who's been horribly subordinated or mm. right now frontline workers who are not getting um, PPE, um, personal protective equipment. If, if you don't get angry, who's, how do you, how do you have social reform? How mm. do you have personal reform? Um, you know, these are really important questions. So it's all fine and good to say, no anger that, you know, but okay, we wouldn't have had civil rights if we didn't have anger. You know, Martin Luther King was not Malcolm. Um, mm. And there's large debates about um, how, you know, in your country about Aboriginals, um, mm. there's large debates about how you achieve social reform and personal reform, but it would be very weird if you didn't have any role for the impulse of moral anger. And so, can you maybe have Martha Nussbaum's talk about trans, trans, transitional anger, you know, maybe a proto emotion of anger, if you want to slant it toward the, um, mm. toward the uh, stoic side. So I think, you know, again, I'm all for really figuring out how you get a smart stoicism, not, mm. you know, some ideology that sounds good, but doesn't work when you think about well, what about, you know, how do you critically engage it? That's all. Hmm. Well, well, he kind of, he kind of had a very, you, you almost might call it a naturalist kind of background, right? He was very, he was very fascinated by the happenings of the world and what everything meant. And you could almost say that he took a philosophy that kind of stated, yeah, there's no place for anger. And then he may have overlaid that over his kind of natural understanding of us as humanity and said, well, I mean, what's it for? Like what, you know, so obviously it has to be good for something sometimes. Right. And I could imagine that being in the courts of Nero, there would have been many times where he probably would have been feeling 
we need some anger here in order to get people to see something, right? Because that the political environment is very, I don't know, toxic at times, right? Toxic would be the understatement. <laughs> yeah, especially in Rome. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, he's, uh, well, he's treading carefully at various mm. moments. I, you know, he's got to be consummately careful um, mm. there. But um, he also... Um, you know, he, it, in, well, in the Trojan women, he has the, it's, it's, it's post-war and the women are being enslaved um, by uh, Odysseus and Agamemnon um, after, after um, the wars ended. And the, the women um, sort of protest, um, won't you show any mercy toward me? Um, what about my my son, Astyanax, and this is Priam's um, uh, uh, family. And, and then there's a war bride who's going to be burnt on the offering, of, on, the, on, the, on the pyre of, um, of, of, a, of uh, Achilles. You know, won't you show her any um, mercy? So there's mm -hmm. a plea, and the plea's got to be filled with some anger. You know, and of course, this isn't didactic stuff. It's a play. And so it could be that we're supposed to learn both sides, both it's a, a, it's a, a cautionary tale about what happens if you, if you don't have, show the right anger, what happens if you show the wrong kind of anger. Mm -hmm. So we don't know quite what to make of it. It's not um, being put forth as a, um, um, an essay style. But mm -hmm. I, I agree that... It, um, you would think there would be a home for it, but it's not clear it gets worked out. That's all because mm. it's a, it, it is a toxic, um, anger is, a, is one of the more toxic emotions. And there, the end point is a life of, of some equanimity and, mm. you know, anger disrupts equanimity, even if it's short term. Yeah. Fear also, yeah. anxiety, fear, anguish, they all upset equanimity. But you you can't imagine not having some moral injury, moral distress if you see things that are so horrific. I mean, how could you not be human and respond to the current crisis that we're globally in? In a, in a cosmopolitan world, this is really the stoic world, we are all in this together. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, Brisbane is a little more protected than New York, San Francisco, London. Paris, but um, but not Sydney, I suspect. Um, and so, how could you not have anxiety? How could mm. you just sort of say, "Out of my hands"? You can't say that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's all about effort and striving. And at some point, we do on outcomes and not just striving. We right. want to measure our skill by how efficacious our skill is, and not just that we're striving. Mm. Yeah, and I was thinking as as you were talking about that, I was thinking about this this quote from Seneca, which I think almost uh, exemplifies what you're saying there about his life. Is he said it's not so life is like a play, you know, it's not the length that matters, but the excellence of the acting, right? And he did tend to you can tell through his writing he had this kind of confidence that no matter what happened. Uh, he could always try to be a good actor. And, and, you know, you might see this as a result of his, his influence in, in writing plays or, um, you know, he, he is that kind of person. And like you say, he obviously wanted his writings to be handed down to posterity. And so there's that kind of, there's that prideful element, right. Of, Hey, this life is just for me to play through and, uh, Hey, I can always, um, put on a good show, you know? Uh, but, can you talk to his confidence around life? Because he, I feel like Seneca uh, more than most embodies what it means to accept fate and to go with the flow and to just try and make the best decisions in whatever you're doing. So I, I don't know if he's accepting fate as much as striving for excellence. And so hmm. At some point, when you're rehearsing evils, for example, 
or better like talk about mental reservation. It's a stoic technique that um, I, I want to go. I think Seneca says at one point, I want to go for a boat ride if it doesn't rain. So I hedge my bets. My want is conditioned by the fact, you know, it may not be great weather. So I kind of uh, have some kind of, as you say, um, a way of anticipating or not being surprised. But another way of thinking about that is it's not so much I'm accepting fate is I'll, I won't, you know, I want to go for a boat ride unless it rains is I'm going to keep updating my information. I mean, my mm -hmm. husband's kind of like this. What's the weather like? What's the temperature? I say, well, it was the same temperature as it was, you know, a half hour ago. It's not that much different, but he's constantly updating the data flow so mm -hmm. that he can make the most judicious judgment about mm -hmm. the present conditions. That's one way of thinking about, mental reservation. It's not so much that you're hedging your bets and accepting fate as it comes, but rather you're being really smart. You're, you're, being, you're, you're, um, you're being open to new information that comes in and you'll change your expectations or anticipations upon the basis of it. It's a little bit mm. like, um, you know, um, the future won't predict the, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Past performance of stocks won't predict future performance. Every, mm. every uh, investor portfolio says sort of like that. And mm. so I think one way to think about it is that it's like cognitive update. It's a way of not so much accepting anything that comes, but I'm going to be try to be as up on my game as possible. At some point I got to let go, <laughs> yeah. but I don't let go very early on. I'm really trying to get as much info. And I think that's a smart way to think about it. Um, mm. You know, I wish in some ways institutions work as well as, you know, the updates and programs do. You know, we need this patch. Let's put the patch in right away. The program isn't mm. working. When we get the patch, it's going to work better. You only know that you're getting, you need a patch because you're getting feedback from, uh, an internal monitor that's telling you that um, there's this, uh, there's a system, there's a bug, a system bug, right? Yeah. Uh, to put it in that, and I think that's one way of thinking about the Stoics. They're really uh, cognitivists. They're very much into the use of reason. So I don't think they're blindly accepting fate as much as doing everything in their power to game the system in a certain way. Mm. Yeah, and and I think you no, know, you're exactly you're exactly right there. I guess what I what I mean is, he was in in the way that the Stoics encourage us to accept fate. He had that first step where he recognized that, okay, I've got this in front of me. It's here. There's nothing I can do about it other than to figure out how I can. Like he said, uh, I was I was going to read this quote later, but he said there are two things that we have and nobody can take away from us. That's universal nature and our individual virtue. So he, he kind of, it was almost like a reductionist saying, okay, listen, as long as I have these two things, then I can always try to make the best virtuous decision based on what I see in front of me. And I think that that's, that's exquisite. You know, that's such a beautiful and, and, and it really plays into his idea of, Hey, life is like a play. You know, it doesn't matter how much time you have because that's out of your control. What matters is how you act in these situations. And how you understand nature because, you know, mm. the Stokes have a line that virtues in accord with nature or it's following nature. That really means absolutely nothing. I mean, we know <laughs> from that, well, we know from natural law theory, what does it mean? Follow nature. Like, is it none of us follow nature in the sense that we're constantly nurturing our mm. you know, the nurture nature division right we there's some things that nature gave us that are really horrible that we have mm. to work on correcting or where you know we change we right now we don't want to follow nature with this pandemic we want to we want to vanquish nature we want to vanquish this mm. the genome of this or the rna of this horrible, horrible virus that is killing us. Um, and, you know, soon we're up to about 60,000. That's more than Vietnam War um, mm. deaths. Um, 
So and that I puts it in perspective. I didn't realize that there was that, yeah, that like, yeah. 50,000 was Vietnam. Mm. So this is a battle and it's a battle against nature, but it's a battle in discovering nature in order to, ba- you know, to battle one of, to battle mother nature in a certain mm. way. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, um, yeah. And, and I think that we can certainly learn a lot from Seneca's approach to dealing with this sort of stuff. You know, it's like, um, you know, if, if you never saw something like this coming, then the surprise of it coming, for example, would have been, it would have made it all the more worse. I guess I had one more question for you before we uh, jump in and, and ask our, our other guests here to um, ask their questions. But I wanted to know from you. So tell, tell me and, and us a, a little bit about how you first came to find Seneca and why you personally were, were moved so much by his words. Why, why did you Uh cling on to him? I've always found Epictetus a bit of a bore. I'll just be frank. Um, (laughs) You know, it's shock and awe and it's one liners. Um, And it's very much in keeping with the, the ancient, Greek Stoics, you know, a lot of it is, is the standard line, but he sometimes is a bit flat footed or, or, you know, he's in for the, the bang Mm. and, um, and, and an amazing writer. There's a lot of oratorical flourish. There's no doubt about it. But whereas someone like Tony Long is really, really moved by Seneca, by, excuse me, by Epictetus, I just find myself moved by Seneca. I'm moved by, um, I find his candor not a sign of his hypocrisy, but Mm. rather a sign of his humility. I mean, humility is a bad word for Seneca because there's not much of that, but (laughs) but a sign of his humanness, you know, that, you know, he's got a huge ego and he's constantly struggling with it. Mm. Um, He's... um, well, I work a lot with the military. So he's, you know, he knows the trenches. He's in the trenches. He's mm. in the trenches of dirty water, po- dirty politics. You can't be in the military without having to deal with enormous amount of stuff you can't stand, with how the bureaucracy works, with um, keeping your mouth shut at the right moments in order to do something better. Um, and that's kind of, where he is he's trying to figure that out Mm. he also um makes clear that he's got friends that he cares about um and that he you know he's the doctor but also the patient Mm. and you know a sick person lives here so i find all that kind of moving and i really you know again whether he wrote the plays or not i think he did i i find them some of them very very moving and they expose the softer, more human side of, of of us. And they could do it because I don't know, you know, is he sort of, is it meant to be the, um, a foil to his other works? I don't really know. Um, Mm. but, um, so I guess that's some of it. And there's just a lot I'm really into. I'm, I'm, I've always been interested in the emotions um, that's where my scholarship is. And so he, he has on anger is an amazing um, uh, discussion of the stoic view of mm. the complexity of emotion. Um, De Beneficis on benefits is a very subtle view about the to and fro, the reciprocation and mutual address and uptake in giving a gift and getting it back. But it doesn't have to be gift in, in, um, in a verbal exchange. You know, how do you know when you're really talking to someone so they get what you're saying and then you respond in a way that keeps them in the game and there's the back and forth. So mm. you know, he's, um, he's in, he, there's ways in which he shows relationships, which is a kind of weird for a, a stoic. Um, mm. And that I've, I've always been you know, my real first love is Aristotle and Aristotle's books on friendship. They're really about affiliation, social connection, rapport. And you get a lot of that being worked out through stoic lens by 
Seneca in, I find, very, um, you know, moving ways. It can get didactic at times. I'm not in for that. Mm. But um, so that's among some of the reasons. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to ask one more question just about the friendship because, you know, you mentioned that uh, he kind of has, you know, he, he comes from a different angle as someone like Epictetus, you know, Epictetus was obviously a teacher. So he had a different style for how he would get his message across than somebody like Seneca, but Seneca, you could say was um, kind of a very well educated friend. Right. And, uh, and he, you know, just wrote beautifully on friendship. I think my favorite line, he says something like, you know, I, d- I don't, I don't become a friend in the same way that Epicurus becomes a friend who, who might want a friend, to have somebody to come to his bedside when he's ill. I, I become a friend so that I might sit by somebody's bed when they are ill. You know, I become a friend to be almost like a hero in their life when they need somebody for them. Can you speak to his, his, that contribution to stoicism that, Hey, listen, friendship is about, you know, it, it, it's about giving something it's about being somebody's for somebody in a time of need so i think you say that very beautifully i can't remember where that um passage comes from that you're that you're quoting um so he he's got to tread carefully because on the one hand friendships are external relations which are dependent on something outside your control so they're subject to the vicissitudes of fortune and so they make you vulnerable they make they they, they're probably the thing that makes us most vulnerable Mm. um the loss of life and so he he knows this you know the line that came reputedly from urban legend has it from an exagoras i know upon being told his son died I, i knew he was mortal and and so we get a lot of spins on that in Stoicism. Mm. So he, he knows that if you're going to find some equanimity, the, one of the worst things that you're going to suffer is the loss of your children, say, predeceasing you. Mm. Um, and so that's a friendship, that's an affiliation. Um, on the other hand, he's trying to find ways to strengthen uh, strengthen the uh, strengthen yourself. Uh, should you suffer? Should you should you lose? And you know that will come from within, but it also may come from other friends. There's sometimes he has our awful remarks, like you lost this friend, find another. Like thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> that's no <laughs> way. For, that's no way for me to face grief. <laughs> yeah. It sounds very callous, um, but you know he's sort of saying. Don't keep nursing your grief. Don't make a production of it. Mm. You know, there is pathological grief uh, um, uh, syndromes, if you like, mm. um, of, of traumatic grief suffering. And then there are ways to try to adjust. We all, we're all different. And the rituals for all of us, given our cultures, are very different. So he, um, he's got to figure out a way of, of having friendship that still respects friends as, in the Stoic language, indifference. They are not inside you as part of your virtue. And the Stoics all thought Aristotle was a bit too waffly on the subject, you know? Mm. How do you ensure your happiness or your flourishing if it depends on things outside yourself so much? Yeah. You know, that that is the ancient game. How do you ensure flourishing? in the face of vulnerability. That's the ancient game. And um, Stoic is, excuse me, Seneca is treading kind of carefully, but you're, you know, but he's, he does it with a very human touch as you Mm. suggested in that passage. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, Or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching, based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. 
Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.